Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with German saxophonist, clarinetist, flutist, and composer Gebhard Ullmann. At the age of six, he started to play the recorder, then the classical flute, and that branched out into the saxophone. He spent quality time studying with the great Herb Geller and Dave Liebman and at the University of Hamburg. He also studied medicine, but ultimately he picked music and he soared. Over time, he's been all over the world and recorded more than 50 CDs as a leader or co-leader. And for a while there, he lived between New York City and Berlin. He's got great stories, so please get to know him and dig this interview. Good morning, Gebhard. Thank you for taking a minute to speak with me on jazz. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome. Actually, it's good evening. <laughs> oh, it, I, you know what? I almost stopped myself because of the time difference, yeah. So it's good morning here and good evening to you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start off here with the, with the ever-present, and I'm wondering if there's any new projects that you have that are on the horizon. Oh, actually, uh, I do have a new project uh, called Gulf of Berlin. And it's a quartet plus a live electronic guy who does analog live electronic. And that's going to be released on ESP disc mm. next year, I think in the fall. I'm not quite sure. Let's go back to the beginning of your life here. Uh, born and raised in Germany. And you play all kinds of instruments. You're bass clarinetist, saxophonist, flutist. How did all this begin? How did you get involved with music? Well, I was always improvising um, since I was a kid, actually. I'm um, coming from a musical family, but it's more classical music, so everybody played uh, written music, nobody improvised, and I was always the one who was improvising from the very beginning, which was a little strange for my mother, actually, I have to say. She came in and she didn't see any music, and any written music I, I'm talking about, and uh, still there was music coming out of my room. That's like when I was eight or nine. So I was always doing that. And uh, at some point when I was maybe 17, 18, I realized uh, I started off playing the flute, the concert flute. And when I was 16, 17, 18, I was very much into what they call prog rock music. We're talking about the 70s, and we're talking about bands like King Crimson and, and, and these bands from, from Britain, Can from Germany, and you know, that, that, that scene. And I realized uh, I need to start a different instrument uh, to be able to um, catch up with the volume that is uh, involved in this music. So I started to play the saxophone. And um, later on, I had a teacher. His name is Herb Geller, or was Herb Geller. He died. Uh, I'm pretty sure you know who he is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he gave me his cl clarinet and said, uh, you, you need to learn the clarinet because if you want to make a living on playing music, you need to be able to play the clarinet. Uh, he was thinking of big band uh, jobs and stuff like that. So I... Uh, he gave me his clarinet, and I learned the clarinet within a um, uh, pretty short time, I have to say. So that was amazing for him and amazing for me as well. But I never was able to really improvise on the clarinet because I didn't hear that instrument so well. And later on, I realized uh, it was because um, the clarinet is a soprano instrument, and it's somewhat a little different from what I did before. So I took up the bass clarinet, and that was like a, a total catch for me. It was like, uh, that's my my world. And at some point, I played all flutes, from piccolo to bass flute. I played all saxophones, from soprano to baritone saxophone, and clarinet and bass clarinet. That was when I was in the 20s. And... Um, mid late 20s and then later on i uh, reduced myself again so now it's basically the bass flute and the tenor saxophone a little bit of soprano saxophone and the bass clarinet and that's it you studied medicine as well did you always believe that you were going to get into music or was there going to be a duality or how how, how did you see things working out 
I start, study medicine because uh, I, I was in doubt about being able to make my living on playing music. Also, I was very interested in medicine, so I almost finished it. But at some point during my studies in medicine, I, st I also started to study music. So by the time I was almost finished with medicine, I was also almost finished with music, studying music, and then I, you know, I took my decision, basically. So you lived for a while between Berlin and New York City. How did you grow as a musician? What was that period of your life like? Well, I, uh, when I studied, I was in Hamburg, in northern Germany, and Hamburg is a... Uh, um, not what you would consider a very a city with a off music or contemporary music scene, although there is something. And then uh, when I decided that I want to be a musician, I moved to Berlin, and um, that was in '83. And in '83, uh, I moved to Berlin, and I decided I want to try if I can make my living on music, which was. Um, pretty easy actually for me to do within half a year I had like almost 20 or 25 bands I was playing in all kinds of music from gamelan orchestras to blues bands to big bands to contemporary jazz uh, so I found uh, and, and in those days already there, in Berlin there were a lot of gigs so I had like 15-20 concerts per month in Berlin alone I found out that I can make my living on music, and then I uh, the next goal was, can I make my living on playing my own music? So that was my next goal, and that took a couple of years, and then I uh, found out I can play my own music uh, and make my living on that. And by then, I already had like 10, maybe 15 LPs back then later on CDs, so that was basically what I did. And I always did workshops. I uh, remember a workshop with Dave Liebman, which was very uh, influential. He was a very influential person for me, uh, both as a musician and a per uh, person, a saxophone player, of course. And I went to different workshops all over the world, actually. So you have 50-plus CDs under your name. As you've mentioned, you've played countless concerts all over the place between Europe and America. What do you like best about being a musician? Hmm, that's a very good question. Well, I always try to play my own music, and uh, that was basically my idea. I had a, a pretty strong idea about what, what my music should be like, or, although that idea changed over the years, as you can imagine. The traveling and the meeting uh, new people, the challenges uh, when you play with other musicians, and also developing my own language in music, those are the things that I really um, like a lot. So if you have a dream tonight and you run into your younger self, say in your you know early days right before you were really getting into music, what advice would you give your younger self now? Well, my advice would be uh, start with your own music, really concentrate on your own music earlier. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Let me ask you this. What was one of the first jazz shows you saw live you just loved? I saw a lot of stuff. Actually, I remember I saw the Duke Ellington Big Band with Duke Ellington. I saw Dave Bubeck back then. I uh, I attended the... The Köln concert of Keith Jarrett, which was released on a double LP later on by ECM. Um, and I saw a lot of uh, contemporary rock music, prog rock music. Actually, I saw a concert of, of the band Queen uh, in a time when nobody knew the band. Uh, that was in, I think, in 75 or 74. I saw a lot of uh, British prog rock bands, uh, but I also saw a lot of contemporary composed music like Penderecki and Lutosławski and, of course, Stockhausen because he's from Cologne and, you know, I was living in Bonn back then, which is nearby. Jazz concerts, you know, there were hundreds of jazz concerts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how do you think... When you look at it, not only from a European and American perspective, but even globally, 
How well is jazz doing in 2019? That is a very difficult question to answer. I think it tends to turn into a into a classical kind of music in a in a sense that sometimes the spirit of the the old days is missing because now it's like the generation after the generation who's playing the music. I mean, I'm talking about uh, Charles Mingus, for example. He was a real genius and he was very creative and he was also a very wild uh, and a wild guy without without looking for any compromise. Today we have maybe two generations later who play that kind of music, if they even play it. Uh, and uh, it seems to me the the wildness, the real, uh, um, how you call it, the the core of jazz music is sometimes missing. At the same time, you have all these young musicians that are doing different music uh, that is a combination of jazz and other styles, like contemporary composed music or other styles in uh, certain types of music in the world, uh, also rock music, whatever. I mean, any any uh, style of music combined with jazz and the improvising. And um, so that is really interesting. Sometimes I'm missing the focus in improvisation, in real hardcore improvisation and trying to get uh, to a point where you uh, develop your own language, because that's what jazz is about, your own language. Uh, you know, like listening to somebody for 20 seconds and in the radio or wherever, and you know who it is. So of all these roads that you've traveled down in your career, are you happy with where you're at? Yes, very much. Especially the last 10 years for me were very successful. It's maybe the wrong word, word but I, I say successful in terms of uh, what I um, what I was able to uh, develop in my own music uh, because I was a late starter. I have to say I was like uh, other people start with you know like 20 years, 22 years. And they already have the, some kind of language. And I was a late starter. So it took me a while. I didn't play the tenor saxophone for many years because I thought that so much was has been say, uh, said on tenor saxophone. So many great tenor saxophonists have been around in the, in the history. And uh, I have nothing to add. Within the last 10 years, I found my personal language on that instrument. And that is... Uh, that feels very good. Let's say you come to Kansas City, you play down on 18 and Vine at the Blue Room, and you have to, you know, kind of come up with an ad or some kind of disclaimer explaining what a live show would be like from you. What would you explain your live show? What would the audience get? It's basically Gebhard Ullmann. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is today. You know, and then that all these different projects that I have because was, uh, some projects are focused on electroacoustic music, others are something between composition and improvisation, uh, or let's call it um, instant composition, which I, I like that term very much. And I think it's a term that comes from from uh, from the UK. My idea in the beginning was how can I combine the great achievements of of modern compositions, how can I combine that with the great achievements of improvisation? Let me explain that for a moment. Sometimes I heard like uh, modern composed music and I thought it's fantastic, great music and, and all the uh, written music and the, all the different colors, fantastic, now where's the solo? And uh, at the same time I went to jazz concerts and thought, oh, great solos, no where's the composition. So that's what I try to combine. So my final question to you is this. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're living your life. Who do you think you are? How can I explain that? I mean, that, that is <laughs> difficult. That, that question is difficult to answer. 
uh, I'm tr just trying to, you know, just trying to live my life also with my family and everything, and I'm trying to do the best uh, I can to add something to the music uh, that has not been done before. Beautiful, and I think you're doing exactly that. Hey, thank you for taking some time out to talk with Neon Jazz today. Good luck with everything, and hopefully we do see you here in Kansas City. Give us your, give us your jazz goods. Yeah, I hope so too. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in Germany, New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Gebhardt for his time, honesty, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. <laughs> Neon Jazz.